All right, let's talk about section 10.5, uh, derivatives from a numerical and graphical viewpoint. Oh my goodness, there we go. Uh, numerical and graphical viewpoints, I don't know. I was lost in my pen. Okay, new definition. The instantaneous, like, like finger snap instant rate of change of f of x at x equals a is defined as f prime. Okay, so that's a prime. So we would read uh, f prime of a is, right, f prime of a is the limit as h approaches 0 of the difference quotient. But what is the difference quotient? f prime of a is the limit of the slope. And it's the limit as the two points on the, the slope line get closer and closer together. So this quantity f prime of a is also called the derivative of f of x at a. So the instantaneous rate of change is also called the derivative. Okay, so I'll use those two interchangeably. Anytime I say instantaneous rate of change, you know that's the derivative. It's like when I say add, you know that that's the sum. Actually, when I say that's the sum, you know that you're supposed to add. All right? These two are just the same way. It's called the derivative of f of x at x equals a. Finding the derivative is also known as differentiating. The units of f prime of a are the same as the units of the average rate of change. Average rate of change, remember, that's just the slope between two points. So it's units of f divided by units of x. All right. If for some reason this limit does not exist, we say that f is not differ differentiable at x equals a, or f prime of a does not exist, uh, a derivative does not exist, uh, Sometimes we'll use DNE uh, on our homework. Sometimes I'll use DNE for does not exist when I'm too lazy to write all the words as well. Now, a tangent line to a circle is a line that touches a circle in just one point. A tangent line gives like the circle a glancing blow. For a smooth curve other than a circle, a tangent line may touch the curve at more than one point or even pass through it. Right here, our tangent line, this glancing blow, will hit the graph again. But here, it's a glancing blow. And that's all we really care, care about, is where it hits, it's a glancing blow. I might hit the graph again up here. We don't care. We're just going to look in this tiny little area right where the hit occurs. All tangent lines have the following interesting property in common. If we focus on a small portion of the curve, very close to the point P, the curve will appear almost straight. If I were to zoom in here, my green line, let's see if I could do it, see if I could draw a decent one. My green line will appear almost straight as it's still curving, while my red line is still a glancing blow. So this is the area that we're looking at. What we're trying to do is we're taking this green curve, right? It does all sorts of things. And we're looking in this little tiny neighborhood, this little tiny area around our point P. And we're saying, hey, this green curve that does all kinds of fancy things, at this little in this little interval, it looks like a straight line, even though we clearly see that it curves. We clearly saw that it curves. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take these random curves that we know not, not much about, and we're making them into straight lines that we know everything about. All right. So it looks like almost indistinguishable, the curve in green from the tangent line in red, and. Uh, that's the best line I've drawn without a straight edge in a very long time, I must say. Okay, so secants and tangents. The slope of the secant line through the points of the graph where f, uh, f of f where x equals a and x equals a plus h is given by the average rate of change. Okay, so slope of the secant, average rate of change, it's just the difference quotient. Now the slope of the tangent line through the point on the graph of f where x equals a is given by the instantaneous rate of change or derivative m sub, uh, sub tangent, slope of the tangent, derivative, this is when we take the limit of the difference quotient. All right, so average rate of change is just slope. Instantaneous rate of change is when we let the two points get super close together, so we take the limit of the uh, slope values as one moves closer to the other. Notice that this is saying that the slope of the tangent line is a good way to estimate the derivative of a graph, uh, derivative at a certain point graphically. So let's, let's do some problems. 
I have my red pen on. I try not to use red too much. I think it's overused. <coughs> All right. So let's estimate the derivative of r of x from the table of average values of change. It might be that you're asked to fill in these values, the 4.5, right? You've had those tables as homework before. Maybe you have to fill out all these values. Um, the average rate of change of r over the interval from 5 to 5 plus h, when this is my h value. So I just set up a table. Um, actually, since we don't know what the function r of x is, this table would be given to you. In this particular one, here we would have to create a table. All right, so I'll show you the two different ones. Here a table is given to us. And as h gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so h close, close to 0, right? We're looking at the interval from 5 to 5, a little bit more. As h gets super small, it looks like 6.49999. That's pretty close to 6.5. What if we're on the other side? What about values a little less than 5, right? So now h is getting super tiny. As h gets super tiny, I add a little bit less, a little bit less of a negative number, so I subtract a little bit less, so I'm getting closer. And notice, again, pretty quickly, these values get close to 6.5. As h gets really small, and we get closer and closer to 5, and this is from the left, That's not true. Um, I do know the difference between left and right, I promise. Do you see how the H is on the right? So we looked at it from the right. See here how H is on the left side of the interval? It's really that simple. I do know my left from my right. So as H gets really small and we get closer and closer to 5 from the right and from the left, we see that the average rate of change gets close to 6.5. This means that we could estimate r prime of 5 to be 6.5. Now again, this table is given to us. We're interpreting it. And second example, now, I'll leave that up there for you. There we go. Uh, second example, now we have the algebraic function. We're going to create a table. Okay, consider the function r of t equals 60t minus 3t squared as representing the value of an ounce of palladium in US dollars as a function of the time t in days. Find the average rate of, uh, Palladium's an awesome music channel that used to exist. I don't know if it still does. It might be out there in the ether somewhere, but I don't know if it's a streaming channel or not. Um, find the average rate of change of R of T over the time intervals from 3 to 3 plus H with H values of 1, 0.1, and 0 0.01 days. We're going to round our answers to two decimal places. Now, this is our action, right? This is what we're going to do. That's how we're going to do it, or that's how we're going to answer it. But this is what we're going to do. Find the average rate of change. So I'm looking here in blue, right? And the average rate of change, I should change up my color here as I'm pointing. Let's go violet. Uh, as I'm pointing here, mm, average rate of change. Average rate of change, we just saw, that's the secant. So we'll take r of t plus h minus r of t all over h. We're doing this in general. Right? Eventually, we'll use a 3. I want to do it in general. Um, just to show you more algebra, really. So I put in t plus h everywhere I see a t in both sections, right? 60 times t plus h minus 3 times t plus h squared. That's r of t plus h. Let me throw some parentheses around that. Minus the original function. So now I distribute 60t plus 60h minus, and then t plus h all squared. I distribute my negative sign, keep in mind that's now a plus 3, distributed the negative sign. Once again, I'll distribute this negative 3, so I have 60t plus 60h minus 3t squared minus 6th minus 3h squared minus 60t plus 3t squared. Now I have a, I have a minus 3t squared and I have a plus 3t squared. Those cancel out. I have a 60t and I have a minus 60t. Those cancel out. I'm left with a 60h, a minus 6th, and a minus 3h squared. Notice everything remaining has an h in it. That's why this division by h isn't such a problem. Once we have everything with an h in it, I'm going to factor out the h and then cancel to get 60 minus 6t minus 3h. 
Now, this is the generic formula, and that's why I like it, is because if you have a part B that says, what about the interval from 7 to 7 plus H? All right, so you could do multiple problems when you have the generic formula. Now, with T equals 3, all right, we could put T equals 3 in here. 60 minus 6 times 3 minus 3H, three that's 42 minus 3H. So our function that we're looking at here is... What did I just say? 42 minus 3h. So I'll take when h is 1. 42 minus 3 times 1. When h is 0.1, I'll take 42 minus 3 times 0.1. And when h is 0 0.01, I'll take 42 minus 3 times 0 0.01. Finding my values each time. And notice I put them both. The two that didn't already have two decimal places, I filled them in with zeros. Okay, and so I filled in the chart. Find the average rate of change over the time intervals, done. Round your answer to two decimal places, done. So now here in green underneath, it says next, estimate the instantaneous rate of change of R at time T, specifying the units of measurement. Now, that's why I did the general thing, because there was a next in general. As H gets smaller, right? As H gets smaller, all we're doing is take the, taking the limit as H approaches zero, of this average rate of change. As h gets smaller, the average rate of change gets closer and closer to 42, right? As h goes to zero, this becomes 42. So we find the instantaneous rate of change, r prime, capital R, r prime of three is equal to 42. Now, what are our units? Um, the value of an ounce of palladium in US dollars in T days. So dollars are function units per day, whoops, is our units of input, right, our T value. So we have our prime of three is $42 per day. Excellent. All right, approximating. Now we're just gonna get to some, there's a whole bunch of algebra. The hardest part of calculus is always the algebra. So as long as your algebra is solid, you've got this. If your algebra is not solid, your calculus will be shaky. All right, so work on the algebra, and it'll always make your calculus just that much better. We can calculate an approximate value of f prime of a by using f prime of a is approximately uh, the slope of the secant line for a small value of h. And frequently in real life, 0 0.0001 is generally good enough. And we have an alternative formula, right? This is just h from one side. But when we have a number line and we have a, why not add h and subtract h? Right? A distance of h units away, so this is h plus a, this is a minus h. I wrote that in the other order because of how I already had it labeled, but look at that. And what's that distance? If this is a distance of h, this is a distance of h. All I'm doing is a different type of uh, formula, but it's always an estimate. All right, we're approximating. This is not equal to, but in many calculators, we use this whole uh, h on both sides and a 2h denominator. Okay, uh, estimate the derivative in two ways. Round your answer to three decimal places. So I went with the standard instantaneous, and then I went with the approximation. All right, and the approximation is this one. So the instantaneous rate of change, f prime of negative 4, is, uh, okay, uh, estimate in two ways. So in, it's actually not the instantaneous rate of change. I didn't even read my notes. This one. Uh, this is the formula that I use. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this all better for you. Instead of whatever I just scribbled there, it's like you're in a real lecture now, right? Okay, sorry, just kidding. Um, this formula I used down here, and this one I used for an estimate for the first. All right, so I used the secant as an estimate uh, with a small h value, um, a, the h value of 0 0.0001, and then I used this uh, double h formula uh, for my second estimate, and it looks like I got the same values. Let's take a look f of x is x over 5 minus 6 when x equals negative 4. We're going to find f prime of negative 4. We're going to estimate first f of negative 4 plus 
our h value, 0 0.0001 minus f of negative 4, all divided by h. I substitute this literally, uh, negative 4 plus that is negative 3 point, right? If you add, nope, uh, yes. If you subtract a point 0.1, you'll end up with a negative 4. Yes, I believe that's right. Over 5 minus 6, and that answer goes there. Uh, f of negative 4, I could find that. Negative 4 fifths minus 6. So it's negative 6 and 4 fifths. 4 fifths is 0.8. So we could subtract that, divide. It's all calculator work from there. Knowing what to plug in, and really, even if you wanted to, uh, this same number that we have here, you could find it by doing negative 4 plus 0 0.0001 divided by 5 minus 6. On a calculator, that's exactly how I would write it. And I'd use all the decimal places. Just use them. It's not that many. Keep them in your calculator. Do what you need to do. And we can find our estimates. Now, scribbling all over this thing, let's find a, a happier color. Our notation, f prime of 4, has another variance. So if y, oh, you can't read that. Let's go black. If y is equal to f of x, dy dx is the same as f prime of x. All right, so the two notations uh, come to us actually from the two different inventors, or formalizers, I like to call them, of calculus. And so we have two notations, and sometimes one notation works better than the other. And you'll find this if you take higher calculus courses, because you find that you're so good at math, you, you want to leave the businesses and, and become a mathematician. Talk to me if that's where you're at. We can make that happen. Uh, if you want to make money, stay in the business department. Uh, again, all right, dy dx evaluated when x is equal to negative 5 is y prime of negative 5. And so I'm going to estimate that, right, with the secant function, or the so slope of the secant. Uh, y of negative 5 plus 0 0.0001 minus y of negative 5 all over that h value. Evaluate. Or do the double version, right? Negative 5 plus and negative 5 minus. Notice that the big, it's always big minus little. If I add a little and then subtract, compared to subtracting a little, always two times h in that denominator. And look at that, our values come out the same. Okay, so these two notations, let's talk about it here. Two guys came up with calculus independently about 16 years apart. And this is when um, distance mattered. Uh, we're looking at... Oh my goodness, 1500s, 1600s is what I'm thinking. Newton and Leibniz, I should know this. Maybe 17, we'll see, 16, 1700s. Today we use uh, parts of each theory. Recall that the average rate of change was the change in f divided by the change of x. An instantaneous change would be then the limit as h approaches zero of change of f over change of x. But delta is a Greek letter, and Leibniz was German. So instead of delta, he used a d df dx is the limit as h approaches zero of delta f over delta x. This is not a fraction. It's a whole unit unto itself. This symbol tells you to add, right? This symbol tells you what to do. It says take three and add four to get seven. This symbol also tells you what to do. This one says add. I apologize. It's trash delivery or trash pickup day. And my dogs love yelling at the trash man. Um, one moment, please, while I yell at them. So this df dx tells us take the derivative. All right, it's just a symbol. This symbol has two little lines. It's super easy. This symbol has letters. It's a little more challenging, but you're in a little more challenging class. All it means is take the derivative. All that means is combine the numbers, right? Um, so it's not a, a fraction. It doesn't follow the rules of fractions. So this ddx portion is called the operator. It's telling you to find the derivative and take the derivative of f is what this one says. This one says take the derivative where x is your variable. That's it. Take the derivative when x is your variable. All right. 
Last page. I know this one's getting a little long. That's all right. We're almost finished. Everything that we're going to do is now on the page. The derivative f prime of x is a number we can calculate, or at least approximate, for various values of x. Because f prime of x depends on the value of x, we may think of the derivative as a function. It's the derivative function. So here we have a definition. If f is a function, its derivative function, f prime of x, is given by f prime of x equals the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. You know that example earlier where I, I left the t in and didn't use the 3 with the r, uh, $42 a day? This is what I was doing. I was just keeping it general and plugging in our specifics later. I shouldn't have, but I did. Definition. For an object moving in a straight line with position s of t at time t, the average of velocity from time t to time t plus h is the average rate of change of position with respect to time. All right, so position is s, so it's change in s divided by change in time. The average velocity, right? Average velocity is just the slope. The instantaneous velocity, no surprise, it's the limit as h approaches 0 of the slope, which we'll call the derivative, ds dt. So v, ver, uh, velocity, is the derivative of position with respect to time. Let's look at it. If a stone is thrown down at 80 feet per second from a height of 950 feet, its height after t seconds is given by the equation s equals 950 minus 8t, uh, 80t minus 16t squared. Find its average velocity over the period. Remember, average velocity just says find the slope over the interval. So that's s of 5 minus s of 1 over 5 minus 1. We evaluate when s is, or excuse me, when t is 5, our s value is 150. When t is 1, our s value is 854. And 5 minus 1 gives us a 4 in the denominator. Uh, trash guy's got to come back to the other side of the street now. So that's negative 704 over 4, or negative 176 feet per second. Remember, our position, its height, is in feet. The time is in seconds, so this tells me negative 176 feet per second. How can you have a negative velocity? This tells us it's going down. The negative indicates the uh, direction it's going. If I wanted to estimate the instantaneous velocity, uh, I would take the limit as h approaches 0 and do this whole same idea. Notice how s of 5 plus h is all right there. Because we know s of 5 already, that's the 150. That's 150, that's right there. So I multiply this out. Here I have 950. Uh, 80 times 5, that's the 400. 80 times h, that's 80h. Those are both negative because the 80 was. Minus 16, and then I'm going to multiply 5 plus h squared. Don't forget to FOIL that. There's that middle term. Don't forget the middle term. 25 plus 10h minus, or excuse me, plus h squared, and then our minus 150. Next step, I leave my first three terms, distribute the 16. Negative 16 times 25 is negative 400. Negative 160h minus 16h squared, still the negative 150. And then I go hunting for things that match. I take my numbers, all my numbers, and I combine them and check it out. Um, I have a negative 400 and a negative 400, which is a negative 800 and then a negative 150. So negative 800 and negative 150 is a negative 950, and here's a positive 950, they cancel out. Um, 80h and a minus 160h, so I'm gonna boop, boop. I combined those to get a negative 240h, and I have a negative 16h squared. Uh, what I don't show here is that I factored an h out. And this is really, uh, important, so I'm going to write it down so that you could see exactly what's happening here. When I factor an H out, now I can cancel it, and that's what I end up with here, the negative 16H minus 240. Now that my H isn't a problem in the denominator anymore, I factored it canceled, simplified as much as possible. As H goes to zero, I'll substitute negative 16 times 0 is 0, and I'll end up with negative 240 feet per second. So over this period of time, 
it averages a velocity of negative 176 feet per second. But at the instant, at five seconds, this stone is traveling at 240 feet per second in a downward motion. All right, a little bit long. That's all right. You've got this. Uh, thanks for listening. Next one coming soon.